personality creates your personal reality. Authentic power is when your personality comes to serve the energy of your soul. The truth is the body is one ecosystem. You can get to the root cause and everything goes away. Thank you for tuning in to the Reconditioned Podcast. I'm Lauren Vaknin. I'm a health writer and holistic wellness coach. And my own journey from disability to remission taught me that wellness through a mind-body approach can take time when we don't know where to begin. And that's why I created this podcast, to bring you the answers to all your well-being questions in the most accessible way possible. Whether you're suffering from chronic illness, raising children in a world of conflicting information, or you simply want to feel empowered and motivated to become the best version of yourself, join me along with expert guests as we uncover the most actionable ways to recondition ourselves back to wellness. Are you tired of trying everything for chronic pain and getting no results? I know I was. The Curable app can help. Try the guided healing program that everyone's raving about and gain more control over your pain today. Get started for free at getcurable.com forward slash reconditioned. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining once again. I'm Lauren Vaknin, and this is the Recondition Podcast, and today I spoke to Dr. David Clark, uh, who works with the well-researched and well-tested concept that many of the chronic pain conditions we suffer from, from back pain, migraines, and nerve issues, to unexplained gastrointestinal issues, are what he calls psychophysiologic. So this doesn't mean that the pain is in your head, it means that it has come about due to unresolved, unexplored or repressed emotions that have triggered what Dr. Clark calls stress illness or mind-body disorder. His work is pioneering and groundbreaking uh, and he follows on from earlier pioneers in this field such as Dr. John Sarno whose books really helped me but with a more modern and well-researched approach. Now you'll hear all about his many tenures and accolades and achievements at the beginning of the episode in his bio. But for now, let me just say that if you suffer from any sort of chronic pain, even if you believe it's due to an injury or some sort of structural abnormality, please listen to this episode. I'm using these methods myself, believing that the brain is my most, my most powerful tool. And if I believe that my trigeminal neuralgia is damaged, I may as well curl up and die because a damaged nerve is not something anyone wants to live with. But if I put the methods Dr. Clark recommends into action, which is what I've been doing and why I asked him to come on the show, it offers hope for a resolution that comes solely from the work that we put in ourselves and it's totally possible. Uh, To date, Dr. Clark has treated over 7,000 patients with success based on these theories. He honestly is just the most gentle, warm and open man and so generous with his time and the information he offered me before and after we recorded. He actually invited me to come and see him in Oregon and I was so taken by his warmth that I might actually have to take him up on his offer. So if you or anyone you know suffers from any sort of chronic pain, you don't want to miss this episode. Don't forget also to like and subscribe if you enjoy it and tell your friends about it. All the links are in the show notes. And if you want to chat with me, feel free to engage with me over on Instagram. Lastly, if you enjoy what I do and you want to help keep this podcast going, please consider donating on my crowdfund page. It will help keep this podcast going for as long as possible. And 10% of anything I earn from this podcast goes to Solace Women's Aid Charity. Now on with the show. Dr. David Clark is president of the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association. He is also assistant director at the Centre for Ethics and clinical assistant professor of gastroenterology emeritus, both at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. As faculty associate at Arizona State University and at the Cummings Graduate Institute for Behavioral Health Studies, he teaches graduate courses on psychophysiologic medicine. He is also a clinical advisor to the Stress Illness Recovery Practitioners Association in the UK 
and a clinical lecturer with Pacific University in Oregon. His book, They Can't Find Anything Wrong, was praised by a president of the American Psychosomatic Society as truly remarkable. He was also the lead editor for the professional textbook, Psychophysiologic Disorders, which has 16 contributors from five countries. Board certified in gastroenterology and internal medicine, Dr. Clark has received numerous awards for patient care and is a member of the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine, the American Psychosomatic Society, and the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association, for whom he co-chairs the Special Interest Group on Medically Unexplained Symptoms. He has been a visiting professor at the Royal Children's Hospital in Brisbane, Australia, and at Oxford University in England. Dr. Clark has lectured extensively on psychophysiologic disorders to healthcare professionals and the public across North America and in Europe. He has appeared on over 100 television and radio broadcasts throughout the US. And Dr. Clark is here with us now. And my goodness, your accolades and achievements are extensive. And I'm so grateful to have you here today. So thank you. Delighted to be here. Um, I lived in England uh, as a boy, actually, uh, the last time England won the World Football Cup. And I, oh my I, goodness. Love, the, I love the country. I'm a Spurs supporter. So um, oh, wow. any chance I have to connect with uh, the UK, I'm, I appreciate it. So that was 1966, I'm guessing. Yes, it was. Wow. Yeah. What, what a great time to have been living in England. Yeah, it was uh, really exciting. And I've... Um, Loved football ever since. Uh, I played as an adult for over 20 years on various teams. Uh, so I'm a big supporter of Spurs and uh, wow. just uh, love the sport. And you're the only American I know that actually calls it football and not soccer. Well, you know, I learned at an early age. What can I say? <laughs> So yeah, thank you again. I'm so grateful to have you here um, to talk about the psychosomatic element of chronic pain or what you refer to as stress illness and what Dr. Sana referred to as TMS. Um, so many of my listeners know that I've been suffering from trigeminal neuralgia and I came across you when I was trying to find ways to manage that. Um, and as I've told you before, that only came on this past April, but before that, I overcame juvenile rheumatoid arthritis that I'd had since the age of two. And I was only able to do that using a mind-body approach. So there's no part of me that is skeptical about yours and Dr. Sarno's theories. So for the listener who's new to this, can you explain what TMS or stress illness actually is and what it means to have a psychophysiologic disorder? Yes, and that's that third one you mentioned is even the most modern term for it that a number of colleagues and I uh, came up with after months and months of debate on uh, teleconference. Uh, we like the idea of the, the psycho refers to the mind and the physiologic refers to the fact that this condition is just as physiologic as any other in um, the way that it's produced. There are uh, changes in the neuroanatomy that have been documented in the brain that uh, distinguish uh, people with these disorders from um, from healthy people who don't have uh, these conditions. Um, and the, the bottom line is that these are symptoms that are not linked to a structural abnormality or an organ disease. So you, you get a symptom, it's chronic pain or it's something else. You go to see your physician, they do the, the diagnostic tests that are designed to uncover the cause. Um, usually most physicians are trained to look for something wrong with one of your organs or, or a structure in the body. And when they don't find that, typically uh, most physicians don't have formal training in what to do next. But that is the whole category of illness that my colleagues and I are concerned with, is illness that is actually linked not to the body's organs or structures, but to stress of one sort or another, to a psychosocial um, condition in their life, either in the present or in the past or both, because there can be interactions between the past and present that are fully capable of generating these changes in the brain's neuroanatomy uh, that then lead to the production of real physical symptoms that can be every bit as severe and every bit as long lasting as symptoms from other forms of illness. So that's what we're talking about here today is symptoms that can be very debilitating, very long lasting. Uh, but the good news is they can be successfully treated. We can uncover the cause um, and then we can almost always do something about that psychosocial issue and people get better. Uh, sometimes uh, 
uh, dramatically better in a short space of time. Other times they need years of psychotherapy to achieve the same level of progress. But the outcomes can be every bit as good as um, what we achieve in, in you know, my case, the rest of my practice. Two thirds of my practice was organ diseases and structural abnormalities. One third was psychophysiologic disorders. And I achieved roughly equivalently good outcomes in both populations of patients. So it's a really a positive message that if you know what to look for, we can find good answers here. Mm. And I guess that's that's the whole thing, isn't it? The, with the doctors knowing what to look for. And I like that you spoke about that, you know, this is a real thing. That we need to make it emphatically clear that this isn't anyone saying the pain isn't real or that it's in your head. You know, it's not psychopathology. The pain is there, but the brain, as opposed to some defect in the body, is what's creating it. So physiologically, how does the brain generate pain? Well, that's uh, a question that's still undergoing uh, a lot of research. Um, but we um, uh, can give some analogies, some examples that can show people how this works. Uh, there's a well-known phenomenon in people who've had uh, a limb amputated or part of a limb amputated where they feel uh, pain in the part of their body that's now missing. So obviously, you know, if you've had your arm surgically removed, uh, there's no way you can be feeling uh, pain at that location because the arm isn't there, and yet uh, people do, and this is called phantom limb pain, and it's being generated in the brain, in the sensory area of the brain that uh, corresponds to the now missing limb, and the brain can do that, you know, even when your limb is still there, or when you're low back, uh, or in your neck, or in pretty much any part of your body, your brain uh, can generate pain. There's another uh, more entertaining example that um, one of my colleagues likes to present um, in his lectures uh, based on an image that was published in the British Medical Journal of a gentleman that uh, suffered an uh, uh, injury in a construction site where a uh, tenpenny nail went through his boot, you know, just pretty much straight up through uh, the boot caused him to have agonizing pain. He was rushed uh, to the emergency ward uh, where he was treated with uh, strong uh, narcotic pain relievers um, intravenously. And then they carefully cut away his boot only to find that the nail had passed neatly between his toes oh, and wow. caused no tissue damage whatsoever. <gasps> And of course, as soon as he saw that, you know, he was fine. The pain went away. But it's a, an excellent uh, and entertaining example of just uh, how convincing uh, our brains can be when it generates uh, these sensations. So that essentially describes what's going on. We're still working on the uh, precise physiologic steps uh, that connect uh, the brain with these symptoms. And it can be non-pain symptoms as well. I mean, many of my patients as a gastrointestinal consultant uh, had irritable bowel syndrome, for example. Uh, but the brain can generate that as well. But um, the, the key here is that whatever the exact mechanism uh, that is happening, we can do something about it. I suppose a, a more um, well-known um, analogy of that is also blushing. If we're embarrassed, we blush, and that's an emotion causing a physical reaction that we have no control over. Or if you're going to a job interview and you mm. really want that job and the, uh, the people that are interviewing you are asking you some very tough questions and you start to get a knot in your abdomen over the, the tension mm. of it all, um, that's a psychophysiologic reaction as well. And it's an exaggerated form of that that produces the abdominal pain that a lot of patients uh, consulted me about over the years. I like using those analogies, though, because it kind of illustrates to people that our brains are constantly doing things to our body without our permission, if you like. And so then the idea that then the brain could cause pain doesn't seem so out there. Yeah, that's right. And it 
it's a normal human experience uh, to have these psychophysiologic reactions. It's just that they typically are very short-lived. As soon as the stress goes away, um, then the physical sensation goes away. The problem uh, that happens with my patients is that the stress is there all the time. And yeah. so consequently, the symptoms are there all the time. But it's, you know, just appalling to me that we don't train our physicians uh, more formally that this is an actual um, real form of illness that afflicts 30 to 40 percent of the people that consult a GP. Yeah. Uh, and so they should know that when they don't find an organ disease or a structural problem, they should know what to do next. They should know how to do a stress evaluation of their patient and look into all these different areas of life that are capable of producing this form of illness. But regrettably, there's only a tiny handful of people that uh, include this in their uh, diagnostic process. Yeah, I'm very aware of that from my own experiences. And it's uh, it's like, you know talking to a brick wall sometimes so I, I find it just as appalling as you do but I, I'd like to know um, I'd like the listeners to hear about your journey and how you as a medical doctor how you got into this field because I think it um, it gives context to what you do. Yeah, well, it's it's almost embarrassing to admit that you know I went through four years of medical school and I was through three years of post medical school training and I had none of this formal training either. I mean, that was uh, back in the 1980s and I had no idea that uh, stress in a person's life could make them physically ill until I encountered a patient who had baffled uh, two universities. She was severely ill with a gastrointestinal complaint that had been going on for two years. Uh, all of her tests were normal. None of us could figure out what was going on. And I was sort of doing an exit interview of her throwing up my hands saying, I'm really sorry that we can't figure out what's wrong. But, you know, I went through some questions about stress. She'd already been asked about stress many times, but she interpreted one of my questions to mean stress from the remote past and began telling me that she had been sexually abused as a girl. Now, nobody had touched her against her will for uh, 25 years, so it wasn't at all clear to me that this could possibly be connected to her illness, which had only been going on for two years. She was 37 years old at that point. Uh, but I knew of a psychiatrist uh, at UCLA where I was uh, in training at that time that had an interest in these mind and body connections. And I thought, we've got nothing left to lose here. I, I might as well um, see if Dr. Kaplan can do anything for this patient and then promptly forgot about the whole situation and, and went on with my other patients. Only a few months later to run into Harriet Kaplan in an elevator, excuse me, a lift, and, <laughs> <That's> uh, <okay. laughs> the, uh, just to make conversation, asked Harriet about what had happened to this patient and Harriet had cured the patient with about 10 weeks of weekly counseling sessions. Mm -hmm. And I just was absolutely amazed by that, that the idea that you could alleviate a person's serious physical condition just by talking to them, um, that was a completely new concept. And so I kind of attached myself to Dr. Kaplan and uh, tried to learn everything I could from her over the next year and a half that I was there, um, thinking that, you know, I might see five or six patients a year that, that had issues like this, um, you know, maybe not that many. Well, it turned out to be five or six a week. Wow. Um, you know, not as severely ill as this patient, but it was 35% of my practice for 25 years. Um, you know, by I estimate by this point, 7,000 plus patients whom I've interviewed in detail about the stresses in their life that were connected to their illness. And they were the majority of my education in this field because there weren't any programs you could take or textbooks you could read or even many journal articles you could read at that time. Uh, this was the, the mid 1980s. And it took me three or four years before my learning curve finally reached a, a decent level. But I was getting good results with patients. I was getting good outcomes with people that uh, were being completely failed by the healthcare system at that point. And that gave me a lot of encouragement to continue. And my colleagues, most of them were supportive uh, of this because um, they, they had nothing to offer these patients and they would send them to me and I would find, um, you know, again and again and again, that there were major stresses in their lives that no one in the healthcare system uh, had even begun to ask them about. 
You mentioned your colleagues. What were your superiors? Because pre- presumably you were a younger doctor at the time. What were your superiors saying to you? Because I know that kind of gastroenterologists tend to have quotas on how many colonoscopies they have to do. And were you being allowed to follow this freely? Well, it was a mixed bag, I have to say. I had uh, the chair of the Department of Medicine was very supportive. He could see that I was getting results with this group of patients that no one else was achieving and that it was saving money for the system because these patients oftentimes get test after test after test and sometimes surgical procedures. Uh, and when they came to see me and I uncovered the uh, the powerful stresses that were causing their illness, uh, none of that had to happen. So he was very supportive. He even gave me um, longer uh, appointment times so that I uh, had enough time to do the detailed interviews that you need to do to uncover what's going on. But other people um, were saying, look, you know, you're not doing as many colonoscopies as some of your colleagues. I wasn't the very bottom of the heap in terms of uh, doing procedures, but I was sort of about two thirds of the way down. And my response to that was, well, you know, I'm doing a lot of the second opinions um, for my my department. In fact, I was doing 90% of the second opinions for a 12-person department. And those patients had already had a colonoscopy, so they didn't need me to do another one. Um, and that argument kind of fell on uh, a little bit of deaf ears uh, some of the time. And they would also say to me, well, you know, you're kind of trying to practice psychology here and you don't really have any kind of formal psychological training. But it turned out that the mental health professionals uh, didn't have any training in what to do with patients who were physically ill. You know, if they had chest pain or back pain or bowel troubles or or migraines or TMJ uh, or trigeminal neuralgia, you know, any of those things, um, the mental health community was very reluctant to engage with that because it hadn't been part of their training. So these patients were falling into a giant blind spot in the healthcare system, and they still do to this day. Yeah. Um, the, the medical community didn't have the psychological background to address the real cause of the symptoms. And the mental health community was reluctant to engage with people who were physically ill because it hadn't been part of their training. So here you've got, um, you know, 30 or 40 percent of people who go to the GP falling into this giant blind spot. So um, I was the one that was achieving the best outcomes uh, for these patients. And I, you know, pointed out that I wouldn't be getting 90% of um, the second opinion consultations uh, unless I was doing something right. And uh, that enabled me to, to continue my practice for, uh, for 25 years. Many of my listeners know about my recent struggle with trigeminal neuralgia, known by the medical community as the suicide disease because the associated pain is said to be the worst known to man. A mind-body approach has always been my preference because I think that true healing can only be achieved through tackling the root cause. But it was only when I found the Curable app that I began being able to take this to the next level. Curable is the reason I'm still doing this podcast, because it showed me how I could reclaim my life and not let pain be my ruler. Most people suffering with chronic pain will know that the fear associated with the pain is one of the most debilitating aspects. Curable has taught me how to overcome fear of movement, of symptoms, and of never getting better. My listeners will also know how involved I am with brain training and neuroplasticity, and Curable has helped me retrain my brain's response to pain. It has been life-changing for me, and if you're suffering from chronic pain, I know it can help you too. To get started with the Curable app, all you have to do is visit getcurable.com forward slash reconditioned and test the app out for free. If you decide to subscribe, you will automatically get a 50% discount just for being a listener of this podcast, because it's my belief that we can all be free from pain. Once again, that's getcurable.com forward slash reconditioned. I mean, I'm so grateful to be alive now when the doctors like you have kind of already done this work where in the 80s this was very new um, and hardly anyone was doing it. I know Dr. Sarno was kind of there at the time as well doing these sorts of things from from the 70s and you touched on changing the um, 
the wording because I think TMS is tension myositis syndrome and myositis is more to do with muscles is that correct? Yes, um, that was a, uh, a concern of my colleagues and I. Myositis means inflammation of the muscles. And it turns out that in this condition, there isn't any inflammation of the muscles. And consequently, Dr. Sarno's uh, work was uh, rejected, uh, partly um, over that concern. Uh, you know, they were the, the people that worked with him. Now, I didn't, I wasn't aware of Dr. Sarno until I think 2008. Wow. Um, but because, you know, he did, he'd worked with people who had back pain and I was a gastroenterologist and we were on opposite coasts uh, of the United States. Um, but he, his, uh, his work was, you know, certainly new. His approach was uh, very innovative and he was getting excellent results. But uh, when you're doing something new in medicine, it doesn't take much for uh, the community to uh, reject what you're doing. And when he chose that term uh, and there there wasn't muscle inflammation and he was calling it muscle inflammation, uh, people just dismissed um, what he was doing, which was very unfortunate. Mm. Uh, but so my, when my colleagues and I came to think about, you know, what would be a new term that um, medical clinicians would find uh, acceptable and that would uh, adequately describe what's going on. You know, psychophysiologic has got too many syllables and it, <laughs> it's, it starts with the word psycho, which puts a lot of people off because they don't know that it means mind. They think that it means that you're, you're seeing, you know, pink elephants in the parking lot. Um, so it has some disadvantages and, and some people when they're talking to patients just call it mind body disorder mm. um, but in any whatever you call it and there are always going to be a lot of synonyms for it uh, uh, the key thing is to uh, recognize it to, uh, you know understand that it exists and that it can be diagnosed and treated as successfully as anything else Absolutely. My mum often used to say to me when I was younger, you know, I think this is psychosomatic, Lauren, because you always have a flare up when there's something to look forward to. And I hated when she used the term psychosomatic because I didn't understand really the meaning of it. But she was so right. And when I look back now, I had arthritis flare ups before, you know, big parties or before a bar mitzvah or before, you know, any big event, um, including my wedding. And I think that can prove that there is an element of that. You know, your, your mind is anticipating something that you know you have to be okay for. Um, I'd like you to go into why the brain does that. And do you have the same views on that as Dr. Sano? Because I know Dr. Sano talks about it being the brain's way of protecting you. The, the brain thinks that opening up to the emotions could potentially be more dangerous so it produces pain to, if you like, protect you from the emotions. Yeah, it's um, this form of illness is uh, complex and the precise physiologic mechanism of what is happening that to produce the symptoms, the, all of the uh, links in the chain between the psychosocial stress and the production of symptoms uh, haven't been a hundred percent worked out. We know that those links exist, but every single step in the chain hasn't been um, uh, figured out in um, perfect detail. So as a result, we need a analogy uh, kind of reasoning to explain things to patients. And the um, hypothesis that Dr. Sarno uses or the analogy that Dr. Sarno uses that the symptoms are there to protect you from your emotions uh, is one of those analogies, one of the early analogies. Um, you know, I personally prefer the idea that um, your emotions are simply expressing themselves uh, in the form of symptoms, that you've got uh, emotions that may be repressed that you may not be consciously aware of. And if they can't be uh, expressed in the form of words, um, they will find some other way. And the way that happens in my patients is they express themselves in the form of uh, nerve signals that are going out into the body and causing physical symptoms. So that's, that's the analogy I use. I find that it's, uh, you know, a better fit with my clinical experience that, you know, mm. that there's not some little 
a robot or a computer inside your head that's deciding, oh, you're, you're about to have an emotion that we need to protect you from, so we better create some symptoms to protect yeah. you. Yeah, um, it you know, makes it, more sense. It, it does to me, and uh, it also encourages people to go exploring for what those emotions are and to put them into words. And what I find is that the more people put emotions into words, either written or spoken, um, then the less those emotions need to express themselves via your body and the symptoms right. uh, improve. So let's unpack that a little bit because we've kind of got to the crux of it, which is um, physical symptoms can be created because of repressed emotions, stress, anything stress related that we haven't dealt with. So that is what we are talking about here and that many, many pain related illnesses, chronic pain, gastrointestinal issues, anything like that, including nerve pain. And um, all those things can come up due to stress factors. So let's unpack a little bit what stress actually means, because I hear a lot of people say things like, you know, but my childhood was fine. And, you know, I had a great childhood. And as if they don't deserve to question it because they weren't abused or something really sinister. But with a lot of people who say this to me, sometimes you can see that there's stuff there beneath the surface and maybe they weren't listened to or they weren't taken seriously or maybe they were misunderstood because they were so different to their parents or, you know, a whole range of things. So, you know, what is stress and why is it impacting us in this way? Well, the the any stress uh, to the body, uh, to the mind, um, the body and the mind have to respond to it. Um, but some stresses are capable of producing um, reactions that are long lasting, that are, you know, long term uh, sources of stress. And, you know, you touched on childhood stress, and that's certainly one of the most important sources of a long-term impact on a person's personality and on their stress level. And it was um, a factor in well over half of the patients that I saw. And the common denominator in those patients is treatment of the child that has a negative impact on their self-esteem uh, in one way or another, that makes them feel like a second-rate human being. And another common denominator is that it's treatment of the child that tends to produce uh, a negative emotion that the child uh, has to repress in order to uh, exist successfully in, in their childhood environment. So anger, fear, shame, grief, guilt, uh, emotions like that that the child has to repress. And those um, uh, stresses in childhood, what we call adverse childhood experiences, uh, can carry on and have an impact uh, on people uh, for years and even decades. I mean, one of my patients, uh, my personal record patient for duration, uh, was uh, ill for 79 years um, over something that happened to her when she was eight years old. And yet, uh, she was able to make significant progress with her condition once we uncovered uh, what was going on. So that's, that's the... Um, a key source of stress, let's put it that way. And, and you're right, many people say my childhood wasn't that bad or other people uh, had it much worse than I did. Um, and it can be difficult for people to recognize the magnitude of the stress that they suffered as kids because they, no, none of us has a, a parallel life that we can compare to. You know, we can't go to a, a happy childhood home life and go through that and just see what the differences are with our actual life. Um, so what I ask my patients to do is uh, imagine a child they care about, either their own child or someone else's that they care about, and imagine that child growing up exactly as they did, experiencing everything they did. Uh, imagine, for example, that you're a butterfly on the wall of your childhood home and you're watching your child or, or the child you care about try to cope with everything that you had to cope with. And, and what is that like for you? Um, can you be that butterfly and, and watch what's happening and, and be, be happy with it? Uh, and if you are, you know, great, we'll move on and we'll look into um, other sources of stress. And there are, you know, quite a number of others that I look for in my patients. Um, but many of my patients, when they, uh, you know, do this thought experiment, they begin to see that things were perhaps uh, a little more burdensome than uh, they might have recognized at first. And, you know, start looking for those 
um, treatments of the child that might have worked on their self-esteem. One of my patients, for example, I mean, this was 40 minutes into our conversation and he finally recognized that the only time he ever got praise from his parents was when he did something better than his brothers and sisters could do it. <clears throat> and he had, you know, three siblings and they were all very accomplished people. And so it wasn't easy for him to outdo them. Um, but that was the only way that, that he got any uh, praise or support was uh, if he was able to do something better than those other three could do. And he remembered sitting with his sister one day and saying, you know, I really wish I was just stupid dumb uh, because then I wouldn't have to try so hard all the time to uh, to be better uh, than you guys are. Um, so it, it, it was having an impact on him even at a young age. He just didn't realize it. He was now in his early 30s and uh, he was just now coming to recognize how uh, powerful an impact this had had. Yeah, it's interesting because I've always advocated um, conscious parenting and the term itself can be seen as, you know, hippy dippy or, you know, like you're a crunchy mum or all these kind of new terms that get thrown around. But in fact, what I'm hearing from you as a medical doctor is the way we treat our children has profound impacts or has a profound impact on the way that they will grow up and process emotions and be able to cope with life. So it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's we quite see, a... Yeah. No, you carry on, please. Oh, well, yeah, the uh, the impacts on the their impacts on the personality as well. I mean, many of my patients are are perfectionists because that's how a child uh, reacts to uh, an adverse environment. They think that if they're perfect, then whatever is bad in that environment might improve, uh, or they become extremely self-critical uh, that. You know, they have absorbed the lesson from the environment that they're not good enough. And so they need to be constantly uh, focused on not doing things wrong, on improving the way that they do things. Uh, and they are critical of themselves far beyond uh, what is healthy as, as their reaction to that uh, negative environment they find themselves in. And they, you know, when you learn that at such an early age, uh, it carries on into the adult years. And yeah. another personality aspect is trying to fix the problems or support the needs of the other people in your household, again, even from an early age. And that leads to uh, relationships during the adult years with people who have problems and yeah. relationships that are not balanced where you know you as the survivor of this adverse childhood environment are constantly trying to fix and support the needs of your partner and the relationships become 95 percent giving and maybe if you're lucky five percent uh, getting back and those are not healthy sustainable relationships and they're a source of stress in and of themselves yeah, I remember when I was reading the literature on all of this and it was saying people who tend to suffer from these psychophysiologic disorders, uh, you know, are you a goodist, you know, always trying to be good and are you a perfectionist? And I was like screaming at the page, oh my gosh, this is me. And are you always trying to, do you want people to like you? And, you know, I was like, oh, it's literally talking about me. And so, so it's a, again a common denominator with people who suffer from these conditions that they're, you know, it, it's like constant effort all the time. And I suppose that in itself is stressful. And I think you and I touched on before we were recording um, my background with this. And um, what was what's interesting is because I've been following your methods and um, kind of the, the the psychophysiologic element of pain. Um, and these disorders is that I grew up with an illness and then lots and lots of other stuff and then I went into remission and because I went into remission seven years ago it was almost like okay well that's there and there are big traumas to be dealt with but I felt uh, what I'm realizing now is that it's all the kind of the minutiae the nuances of daily life growing up with an illness as a child that you don't really acknowledge, those are the things. Those are the things causing the problems. That's really the trauma because big traumas, I think, some of us, some of us don't, obviously, and, and don't get me wrong, there are those too because, you know, 
none of us get out of this life unscathed. But the big traumas we can often deal with because they're so apparent and they're so obvious. But this is what I'm realising, all the little things of being so different as a child or not being understood because you have this sensory overload issues that I had and all these little things, you know, that's what I'm going back to now, dealing with in the hope that addressing all of those will help me with this this trigeminal neuralgia. Yeah, this this was something that took me several years to realize when I was early in my experience with this form of illness was that uh, adversity in childhood that <clears throat> impacted the self-esteem uh, didn't have to be you know something like sexual abuse as it was in that first patient or physical abuse or violence in the home or the more uh, overt chaotic um, childhood environments that uh, we all know about and some people characterize as being the big T uh, trauma but the the more subtle forms could have every bit as significant an impact on a person long term. The Again, the common denominator was that if it made you feel like you weren't measuring up, if your childhood experience made you feel like a second rate human being in some way, and that includes, you know, if you are a, a person of color, if you are a member of a sexual minority, if you are, you know, simply a woman who isn't treated with full respect, um, you know, all of those, if you are disabled, if you have a childhood illness, um, all of those things make people feel like uh, they are not as good as the majority of other uh, children out there. And children feel that and they absorb that uh, into themselves. Um, the Australian uh, comedian Hannah Gadsby speaks about this, uh, that she was uh, a lesbian and knew this at an early age. And in her community in Tasmania, these were absolutely uh, discriminated against and biased against and she as a person absorbed that into her self-image that she was not as good a person as others in her community. So um, this is what matters long term in, in terms of stress producing physical symptoms uh, later in life is um, the uh, negative emotions that are repressed and the uh, the sense of yourself is not being as good as others. And it doesn't really matter how those two things are produced in a person. Um, the effects long term are very similar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really waking up to this now. And, you know, I, what you were saying about the fe just feeling like you are a second rate citizen or that you, you're not as good as everyone else. And I remember getting to my teenage years and having this kind of light bulb moment when I went to high school of, wow, my childhood was so different to everyone else's. And oh my goodness, now I need to be normal because my teenage years were my best years, were my healthiest years. Just those, got that kind of four years of high school, thankfully. And I spent my entire time at high school doing nothing other than trying to fit in. I lost out on those years in terms of trying to know what I wanted from life or who I was because I just wanted to be normal because of realizing that I wasn't. And so it really, it, it, that really resonates and I hope that does for others too. Maybe you haven't been through, um, you know, childhood illness for those that are listening, but it could be anything that made you feel less than others. Um, and I think it's interesting to know that anything that made people, that makes people feel like that can be a cause of this stress. Um, and before we talk about stress and actually treatment for this and, and what we actually do, what can we do in our own parenting as parents now to ensure that we don't allow this to happen for our children? We could potentially raise a generation of children that don't suffer from these disorders. Yeah, I, it was something that I'm always grateful to my patients uh, for teaching me uh, so that I could raise my own children uh, in a healthy way. And a lot of it has to do with looking for uh, behaviors and activities in your children that um, they do well. There's a tendency for us as parents that if our children are doing something well, we just kind of 
uh, you know, we accept it, we're grateful for it, but we don't necessarily let the child know that we've noticed it. And I think it's important that when a child does something genuinely well, I mean, and I don't advocate praising children all day long for no good reason. I think it's important that the child knows that when they're receiving praise from the parent, it's because they genuinely have earned it. And mm -hmm. But at the same time, we, we want to let them know that they have genuinely earned it. We don't want to just um, accept it and not uh, let them know that we've noticed it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the flip side of that is that when they do things that don't measure up to our expectations, um, that we don't necessarily come down on them uh, every time. I mean, any person who's grown up in a challenging environment is going to have a certain degree of perfectionist uh, tendencies. And you don't want to apply that to your child because you can see um, all day long, almost continuously, uh, areas in which your child ha could be doing something better. And if you point that out to them, they're going to be getting the message that, you know, they're not measuring up, you know, time after time after time after time. And that's going to contribute to a negative self-image that, you know, no matter how hard they try, um, you know, no matter how high a bar they jump over, their parent is constantly moving the bar a little higher. Right. And after a while, you're just going to burn out on that because no amount of effort uh, is ever going to seem to be enough. Mm -hmm. So it's important to um, learn to sort of bite your tongue that when you see your child doing, you know, six things that they might have improved upon, maybe you mention one of them uh, to them and just let the other ones go because, you know, we none of us is perfect. You know, we've all, you know, make mistakes on a regular basis and we don't have anybody following us around, you know, telling us how we can, you know, improve what we're doing. Uh, if we did, we would probably, you know, drop kick them out of our front door um, in in short order. Um, but the child, the child, you know, doesn't have the uh, ability to do that. So maintaining a good ratio of um, sincere, um, well-earned uh, praise um, to um, suggestions for improvement, I think, uh, is is important and it's something that i learned uh, from my patients to um, apply to my own children and you know i have two sons and they're now in their 30s and they've they've done just extraordinary things uh, with wow. their lives and i'm sure that is mostly down to you and all these no that you <laughs> i wish it was but uh it um i i really you know i'm as a physician, you know, I apply a, a very high standard um, to what I do at work. Um, but if I applied that same standard to my children, you know, they would have heard over and over and over again, here's how you could do this better. Here's how you right. could do that better. And, you know, it's well intended, you know, I'm only trying to help. I want them to be successful. But if I'm doing that all day long with them, what I'm really doing is sending them a message that, you're not measuring up to expectations. Yeah. You're not enough. You're not good enough. That's right. Well, the fact that you say that they're doing really well and, and you followed those ideas that you had, that just proves how much, you know, you could have gone on at them all the time. I'm a doctor and I've achieved this and, you know, you guys aren't doing enough and you didn't do that. So, and I think, you know, we hear about this a lot with people when their parents push them a lot academically and every time they get praise, it's because you know, they got another A or they did really well in school and everything's about what they did academically. So when they grow up, they kind of don't know how to function in the real world because all their value was put on their scholastic abilities. And so they don't know where their worth is outside of that. Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's also the phenomenon that, um, perfection is, uh, is, the only acceptable level and mm -hmm. that gets very tiresome after a while yeah and people people don't uh, um, you know they burn out so let's get on to the exciting stuff which is the idea that you might be suffering from chronic pain or some sort of chronic illness and you might have suffered for a long time but there is a way out of this when someone comes to you and you can see and you go through their history and you can see that this is psychophysiologic, 
What is the treatment plan? You know, I like to first get the full stress evaluation, uh, which also includes, you know, stresses that you're experiencing at the moment. Uh, I want to assess people for whether they're suffering from depression uh, and anxiety disorder or post-traumatic stress from a terrifying or horrifying event. And I want to know if they are the kind of person that takes care of everybody else in their world, um, but has difficulty putting themselves on the list of people they take care of. Because mm -hmm. a lot of my patients, they're just constantly running around meeting everybody else's needs. And if they get five or 10 minutes to relax, they start immediately thinking about what they could be doing for somebody else. So that's a, that's a big one. Uh, so the, the treatment depends on the specific stress or stresses that people are suffering from. But we'll focus on the uh, long-term impact of childhood stress because that's uh, such an important one and affects uh, you know, a majority of my patients. And you know, we've talked about the low self-esteem. I want to try to reverse that. And we've talked about the repressed emotions. I want to get those uh, expressed in words. And to get the emotions expressed in words, uh, people first need to recognize that those emotions are there. And uh, so I'll oftentimes do thought experiments with people, um, you know, asking them, for example, to uh, imagine raising your children exactly the way you were raised or putting them in that kind of environment. And let's just do that for a week. And how would that make you feel? And that can help people connect with uh, some of the emotions that maybe they've repressed for all these years, which they had to repress in order to ex get through their, their childhood experience. And once they have connected with those emotions, then they can start to put them into words. They can journal about them. Uh, a good exercise that helps a lot of my patients is to write a letter that they don't mail uh, to the person or persons that mistreated them when they were children. And oftentimes, once they start writing, um, the emotions begin to flow. And people are often quite shocked at how much winds up on the page. One of my patients, um, she put me off for a year and a half before she was ready to do that writing exercise because it was such an emotional uh, concept for her. But once she started writing, and she thought she'd only get a couple of paragraphs, um, but she couldn't stop. And she ended up with nine single space pages, and it made a huge difference to her physically. Um, for the self-esteem, I like people to imagine their childhood experience as being something analogous to having been born on the far side of a dangerous mountain or in the middle of a, a horrible wilderness that they had to find their way out of uh, to get to be adults. Because that emphasizes that they were in this situation through no fault of their own, but they, they should uh, take tremendous credit for having uh, made their way out of there. Um, that it takes a tremendous personal strength uh, to carry the stress load that some of my patients have carried. I mean, my, that very first patient, her father had sexual intercourse with her an average of once a week from age four to age 12. I mean, it just a, a horrible experience. Um, and yet she felt, you know, again, the, the, the outcome of that was that she felt like a second rate human being. Um, and to help her flip that, you know, 180 degrees to uh, how heroic she had been to endure that, uh, to make it, you know, through a, a difficult adolescence, as you might expect, to reach now um, a life where, you know, she had a, an excellent uh, family life, two children and, and a husband who cared for her, you know, a tremendous accomplishment coming from that, uh, that background. And yet she, she carried this, this burden of feeling like uh, someone who should be ashamed of herself. So to turn that around, you know, you were born in this wilderness, you found your way out, think of yourself as heroic for having done that because you absolutely uh, meet the definition of a hero uh, from what you've done. And when people can start thinking of themselves in those terms, uh, it, it makes a huge difference to uh, how not only how they look at themselves, but uh, lots of their relationships um, that are um, that are ongoing, including relationships with people who mistreated them as children, whom they may still be interacting with uh, in a negative way, and it, it can give them the strength to set some boundaries with those people uh, so that the the harm is reduced. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I love the idea of journaling. I journal a lot and I follow Nicole Sachs's work. I know you know Nicole. Um, she advocates journaling and a way of doing it, which she's coined the term journal speak. Yes. And I really love the analogy she uses about a reservoir. She says, imagine your emotions as a big reservoir of water. And by journaling each day, you're, you're removing one ladle from that reservoir. I think that's such a beautiful analogy. Um, yes, I, you know, I, speak I, I to, admire her work. Yeah, she's brilliant. She's really trying to get this message out, isn't she? Um, and people I speak to often say that they have this block when it comes to sitting down to journal and they just can't bring themselves to do it. Why do you think that could be? Well, the um, survival of their childhood has frequently given them some very powerful skills at keeping emotions locked up. And when you sit down to write, you're, you're going against, you know, years of training at an early age about keeping those emotions in a place that you can't access them. So that's, that's why I emphasize these thought experiments of, you know, imagining a child you care about growing up the way you did that has a way of connecting people with some of these emotions because when you when you look back at your own life it can be a challenge to imagine what it must have felt like but if you imagine you know a child you care about um, having to experience that you know even if you don't have any children in your life you know walk by a um, elementary school at recess and um, pick out somebody on the playground that looks like you and imagine that kid yeah. having to cope with everything you had to cope with uh, and that can help connect you with the emotions and you can start writing about those and, mm. and if you can't write complete sentences just write random words all over the page that come to mind because yeah. that will start the process yeah I would say to people you know if you have this this kind of idea that you feel blocked to journaling just sit down open a journal or even your computer Nicole you know recommends doing it on a computer if you're scared that someone else is going to see what you're doing write it out in a word document then delete it it's not about saving this so you can read it years later you know dear diary it's it's none of that it's literally to get it out and once it's out you can delete it and so for anyone listening that has that block my advice would be to just sit down and start writing and see what comes and because I had this experience recently when I sat down and I thought okay what is holding me back that's causing this condition to stick around because I have overcome too much to have this hold me back now and I thought okay and I had decided to you know that I was going to start therapy because in your advice you know if you kind of aren't seeing the changes after releasing the emotions and journaling about it and acknowledging what's there, then perhaps you need some um, to see a psychologist. So I thought, you know what, my mum has been saying it to me for years and after all these years of suffering with, you know, chronic illness from the age of two, it probably makes a lot of sense that I start therapy and actually have someone to talk this through and we're doing some EMDR. But before I started, what I did was I sat down and I started journaling as if I was talking to the therapist. And this was a day that I had had a really, the second flare up of this condition that week and it was really bad and I was in huge amounts of pain. I couldn't function, I couldn't be with my kids. I, I mean, I could barely swallow, I couldn't eat, couldn't drink. And I started writing as if I was talking to the therapist and, um, I, it, it just came out, everything was coming out, everything and everything, and I was sobbing, and, you know, really just crying and talking about all this stuff that was really deep, and afterwards I was exhausted, and I went to sleep, and I, and this was the middle of the day, thankfully it was a weekend, and my husband was around to help with the kids, but, and then I woke up, and the pain had subsided, and I felt this release, you know, I felt like something had been removed, you know, like a brick had been removed from my chest, and I'm only telling this as, you know, my, for, from my experience so that people can see the power of journaling and just how much we repress and we hold inside until we give ourselves the permission to really let it out. Yeah, it, um, it's remarkable how 
expression in words can stop the process of emotions being expressed via the body, but it absolutely is one of the most effective techniques. Not everybody is ready to do it on day one that I suggest it to them. As I mentioned, one of these patients, uh, one of my patients had to wait 18 months before she felt ready. And even then she, she told me, I'm only going to write two paragraphs uh, and then I'm going to stop. And, and you have to stop badgering me about doing writing exercises because I'm not comfortable with it. I'm just going to write two paragraphs and that's all I'm going to do. And she wrote two paragraphs and then three and then four and ended up with nine pages um, and made a big, di big difference to her health. I think it's a good example of something that I always advocate. My biggest thing in life that I'm constantly advocating and talking about is us as human beings taking responsibility for our own health and kind of not expecting others to constantly do the work for us. So sometimes it's hard, you know, life is hard and there are obstacles in the way. There are always going to be obstacles. But if we take that responsibility and if that means we have to sit and do something that's hard like journaling, because as my favorite human being of the moment, Glennon Doyle says, we can do hard things. Um, I'd like you to tell me more about the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association that you are president of, um, because you are helping people through that association to do this work. Yes, yeah, so it was founded by a group of colleagues uh, in the United States that uh, do this work in 2011. And I was one of the co-founders, and I've been the president uh, since it was founded. We've put on conferences. Uh, we created an online webinar course that's mostly uh, for professionals, but we deliberately keep the technical jargon uh, out of it so that uh, even people without any professional training uh, can take the course uh, as well. And it's based on a course that I've taught in graduate schools to doctoral students uh, since 2013. So it's been vetted by several hundred um, people with master's degrees in mental health. Um, and we've sort of interacted with them about what they find the most valuable. Uh, so that's on there. We've come out with a new textbook uh, a little less than a year ago with 16 authors uh, from around the world, um, uh, English-speaking countries around the world, uh, with all different chapters uh, covering diagnosis and treatment. And it's again intended for professionals, but once again, I was the lead editor, so I made sure that we didn't put any uh, technical language in there because we wanted the medical professionals to be able to read the mental health chapters and we wanted the mental health professionals to read the medical chapters. So we had to take all the, the technical jargon out of there, which means that um, well-educated members of the general public who like to read uh, can get a lot out of that book as well. Yeah. I love that you're making this accessible for everyone, but also that you're bringing this to the medical community because I think when the medical community wake up to this, that's going to filter down to the average person suffering with pain. Yeah, then there we have a sister organization uh, in the UK called SERPA, the Stress Illness Recovery Practitioners Association uh, that's run by Georgie Oldfield in Yorkshire, and they're doing excellent work there with uh, teaching the medical community uh, in the UK. So between the two of us, uh, we're at least covering the United States and the UK, and we have um, lots of people interested uh, from other English-speaking countries uh, around the world. And it's essential because this condition afflicts about one in six adults. And at the moment, there's only at best a few hundred practitioners that know how to diagnose and treat this condition. So there's a huge uh, disparity between um, the number of people in need and the number of people who can who can meet that need. And that's what the PPD Association uh, is trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's amazing. I've been through the website um, extensively and I've also spoken to Georgie Oldfield and watched her TED talk. So that was, um, that's a good one for anyone listening also. And you're also involved in the Curable app. Yeah, I'm one of their scientific advisors. Um, I met with their um, CEO early on and uh, shared a lot of the ideas that I've just shared with you uh, that have now gone into the app. And he's got uh, most of the most experienced uh, psychophysiologic uh, practitioners uh, uh, 
on his scientific advisory board and they've taken the best ideas from them and incorporated them into this app which you know you can have on your computer or your smartphone and you know they charge you know a relatively small amount of money uh, oh it's really it's really affordable it's like three pounds a month or something and the user interface is you know very friendly and forgiving and has lots of resources uh it's um you know, one of the absolute best things for filling this huge unmet need between um, the patients and the small number of medical practitioners. Um, so yeah, I recommend it highly. I recommend it for anyone who, who is suffering from chronic pain or chronic illness and hasn't yet discovered the curable app. We were talking earlier about treatment plan. That has to be part of the treatment plan. We're, we're talking, uh, you know, diagnosis, journaling, and 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 some sort of mind body approach so for me also you know meditation to calm the brain is part of the treatment um and to make space in the brain but the curable app gives you all those things visualizations meditations but it also offers brain training and education so educating us on what's actually going on in the body and the brain when we're suffering with chronic pain um, and the brain training to try and, for example, one of the most common things that people with chronic pain suffer from is fear. The fear that it's going to come on, that you're not going to be able to live your life, that you're not going to be able to plan things, that your life is over. Even if you might be experiencing a period of remission, you have this constant fear that it's going to come back at some point. And so this app really, I have to say, it's probably one of the most well-developed apps I've ever come across as well. Um, it's so easy to use, like you say, and it really is the the best, I think, first place for someone suffering with chronic pain to to stop. Um, and the voice of the lady who narrates everything is also really lovely and calming. Yeah, no, I know. I really appreciate Laura's work on developing the content. We've had many conversations about uh, the material that goes into the app and she's done just a, a wonderful job as has their programmer as well i mean he's he's made this thing work with all kinds of different platforms so it, it really is a, a remarkable piece of work and the the thing the single most remarkable thing is that it is again aimed at alleviating symptoms most of the other mind related apps uh, that are out there have more to do with just helping you live with your symptoms or you know trying to cope with your symptoms but the curable app along with the whole psychophysiologic approach uh, is aimed at actually alleviating symptoms you know making them go away just just the way medicine does with um, other forms of illness we're trying to you know, cure those forms of illness. We're trying to make the symptoms you're having from organ diseases and structural abnormalities go away. And the curable app is doing that. And the psychophysiologic approach is doing that for mind body disorders. Yeah. What I want to touch on quickly is that there might be listeners out there now who might be saying, well, I have a herniated disc or a structural abnormality even. Um, or that their condition was triggered by a big car accident or another injury. Can they still suffer with this? Yes, the challenge there is to know what the relative contribution is. Um, If you have chronic pain and you've got it in the area of a structural abnormality, well, is the structural abnormality doing that? And it turns out, at least in the the spine, that 70 to 85% of the time, it is not the structural abnormality that's doing it. It is the mind-body condition that is causing the symptoms. But for any individual patient, it can be a bit of a challenge to determine the relative contributions from the structural problem versus the mind-body and the stress problem. So what I recommend people do is that they just you know, keep working with their doctors. Um, you know, If they can hold off doing on any invasive treatments, uh, that would be uh, ideal. And then use the mind-body techniques, use curable, use all the research sources that are available on ppdassociation.org uh, and see if your symptoms begin to uh, improve with respect to that. My colleague, Dr. Hanscom, who's a spine surgeon, 
who contributed a chapter to the new textbook, um, he found patients who had uh, spine x-rays and MRIs that he said 10 out of 10 spine surgeons would recommend surgery. But he put them through what he called a prehabilitation program, meaning a mind-body program, before they went through for their surgery in the hope that their surgical outcome would be better. Uh, and lo and behold, finds out that that program, that mind-body program, alleviated their symptoms so often and so much that many of them canceled their planned surgery. So it can be a challenge uh, to tell. And so the best approach is to, you know, use mind-body, you know, listen to your doctors and do what they say, but use the mind-body approach as well and see if you make progress. And many people are quite surprised by how well they do. Mm. Because I remember in one of Dr. Sarno's books, he also spoke about even if you've had an injury, even if you've had, you know, like a big car accident that has triggered this problem, tissue heals, you know, human body tissue heals over time. So what is it that's making it stick around three, five, ten years later? There is something, there could be something psychophysiologic there. And the other thing to mention is that, you know, we can't underestimate neuroplasticity and the brain's ability to change things in the body even if there is a structural abnormality. Yep, that's absolutely right. And there's research, you know, we've got going back to the mid-1990s, they did uh, MRI scans of the spines of people who felt perfectly well just to see, you know, what their spines looked like. And it turned out that a majority of people over the age of 40 have abnormalities in their spines uh, that they had no sensation of whatsoever. So when you go to um, have an MRI of your spine because of pain and you find some abnormalities, particularly if there's not any uh, physical symptoms of nerve damage uh, in your lower limbs, um, then you have to wonder, you know, maybe this is just um, part of the aging process in your case and is not contributing uh, in the slightest to your physical pain. And that, that appears to be the case, as I said, for 70 to 85% of uh, abnormalities that are found on the MRIs, they're not contributing to the symptoms. Yeah, normal abnormalities. And, I, you know, and it has to be said as well, even if you have nerve damage, because I'm being told I have this, you know, nerve issue, which is, you know, someone tells you you've got a damaged nerve, it's the most frightening thing that you can hear. But I truly believe in the power of the brain. I think if the brain, there's so much the brain can do and so much we don't know that the brain can do even, that, you know, if it can do all these other things, it surely can heal a nerve. And I, I, I truly believe in that. Yeah, I again, this wasn't part of my formal medical training. And I've been shocked many times over the years by the number and severity of symptoms that have responded to this approach. My personal record patient had 27 different symptoms. You know, he came to me with a printout from the internet on which he had circled 27 different physical symptoms that he was suffering from, and they were all successfully alleviated uh, with a mind-body approach. That very first patient I talked about who was sexually abused, you know, her, her symptom was having one bowel movement per month for two years. Uh, a profound uh, alteration of her intestinal function. And she was taking four different laxatives at double the usual doses, and it was not doing anything at all. And in two and a half months of psychotherapy, uh, all of her symptoms went away, and she was able to stop all of the medications. I, and that was just my first patient. You know, 7,000 right. patients later, um, you know, I, it's just um, been a remarkable uh, experience in my career to see, um, you know, the first story in my book is a patient who was hospitalized at a major university uh, 60 times over 15 years. Yeah, I and love she that was, story. She was cured in a one-hour conversation. So... Yeah, the the power of the mind is, uh, it's beyond what I was trained to believe, let's put it that way. You are a merit to the medical community. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's been very rewarding to, uh, to have so many teachers uh, over the years, um, my patients. You're very modest as well. 
What would you say to someone listening who is suffering from chronic pain, but after listening to this is still skeptical? Well, skepticism um, is welcome. You know, we take a scientific approach to this and we insist that there be evidence for what we do. There's a uh, bibliography of research papers on our website that is closing in on 200 references. Each of them has a paragraph that describes the key findings. So um, you can look at that uh, and see the evidence that supports uh, the approach. This is on ppdassociation.org. There also are two questionnaires um, under the symptoms tab, um, one of which is 30 questions long. The more of those questions to which you answer yes, the more you fit the context in which we usually find uh, mind-body uh, symptoms. And the, the second questionnaire is, is nine questions that uh, digs a little deeper into the uh, hidden stresses that can be responsible and provides some, uh, some context uh, after you answer the question. So between those two questionnaires, you can get a lot of insight into whether you might fit this, uh, this pattern. So um, as I let you know before, we, I tend to end the show with a little segment called All About You. It's just oh. a little bit of fun where the listeners can get to know the guest a bit better. So here we go. If you were given the opportunity to change just one thing within the medical system which you don't feel which you feel doesn't work, what would it be? I would like every physician who graduates from medical school, in fact every healthcare professional, to understand that psychosocial stress can cause real symptoms and that effective treatment is available. Just people understanding that concept would mean that they could no longer dismiss patients simply because uh, they have no organ disease or structural abnormality. You know, there was a famous speech in American medicine in 1925 by uh, Francis Peabody in which he said, you know, it's, isn't it, Narrow, he was asking this rhetorically, isn't it narrow-minded to limit your practice just to structural abnormalities and organ diseases? Um, and, you know, he's absolutely right, 90 years ago, 95 years ago, um, but we've forgotten that. Yeah, I think most doctors do. I'm always told that it's a coincidence that I went into remission after 27 years with a disease. It was a coincidence. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Um, okay, what's the worst thing about being a doctor? Um, probably the worst thing is not having complete control of your life. You know, people can get sick uh, 24 hours a day, and so physicians need to be uh, available uh, to meet those needs. And that means that there are times when uh, your patient's need comes before everything else, yourself, your spouse, your family, uh, you need to be there for them. So it's it's demanding. Um, and, you know, I've had weekends uh, on duty when I put uh, 150 miles uh, on the car and worked, you know, 30 or 40 hours from Friday night to Monday morning. So wow. it, it can get uh, very busy and you can miss aspects of your family's life that you might otherwise like to be there for. But it's it's part of the job and it's usually a highly rewarding to be able to uh, help people who are uh, in an extreme situation yeah absolutely um one lesson you've learned through being a doctor that has profoundly impacted your life that perhaps you wouldn't have learned otherwise well i would go back to what i said earlier about my children that my professional life is focused on managing uh, details of what I do uh, to the highest level that I can and recognizing that that was not a good idea when it comes to my family uh, was something that I learned from my patients uh, because many of them experienced that kind of family environment when they were growing up and it had a significant negative impact on them uh, 
through the years as they became adults. So I had to learn a different approach to um, being a husband and father. And fortunately, I learned that early on in my children's lives and uh, made a huge difference for which I'm forever grateful. Yeah. And just a little bit of fun to end on. If you could try a profession <laughs> other than your own, what would it be? Well, I... I seem to have a, an enjoyment and a knack for uh, psychology in interacting with people and trying to understand what it's like uh, to be someone else. And I, it's always been appealing to me the um, matchmaking business, you know, <laughs> things like uh, Match.com and Tinder and apps like that. And I've been fascinated by the psychology of what it is that brings two people together and causes them to be happy with each other for a long stretch of time. i am personally been married for uh, over 43 years and wow. still going strong. And, you know, how did that happen? You know, what is it <laughs> yeah. about myself and my wife that uh, created this um, wonderful relationship? And um, how is it that you take, you know, a couple of people out there uh, and bring them together with the same sort of success. And I think that's uh, an area of human interaction that still has quite a bit of mystery about it that I find uh, intriguing. Wow, that was not what I was expecting, which I like. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. David Clark, thank you so, so much for this. You are truly, as I said, a merit to the medical community, and you will be leaving such a legacy in... Well, you already are leaving such a legacy. And uh, your book, They Can't Find Anything Wrong, is, I've read it myself. It's brilliant. It was um, one of the things that, you know, brought me to this work. And I'm forever grateful for all your work. Your websites are stressillness.com and the ppdassociation.org. That's right, yes. And uh, I will be sure to put them in the show notes. And um, have I missed anything? Is there anywhere that people could find you anywhere else? Those are the places where we put the, you know, the main resources. Stressillness.com has information about my first book and ppdassociation.org has everything else. And, and PPD Association has a Facebook page as well where we put announcements about um, everything that we think uh, is valuable that's going on in the field. We focus very much on uh, science-supported, uh, evidence-based uh, concepts. Uh, there's a lot out there in the alternative health field that is um, more about people making money, let's put it that way, than it is about uh, evidence-based um, um, real treatment. Uh, so we, we focus on what's uh, science-based, and if people want to follow us on Facebook, uh, that's another good way to keep up to date with what's happening in the field. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for imparting all your wisdom and all your hard-earned knowledge on us. And um, we maybe will speak in the future and do another episode and see where I'm at after following this journey. That would be great. Yeah, I'd be, uh, I hope that your journey takes you to a good place uh, in the very near future. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. The Recondition Podcast is proud to support the El Shaddai Charitable Trust, an organisation in Goa who provide homes for orphaned children and support for families living in extreme poverty by giving them a second chance at life. You can donate or support at childrescue.net.